So I want to welcome everybody to the African History Network show today. It is Thursday, October 28th, 2021, and we are live broadcasting right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio in Detroit and our YouTube channel, the African History Network, and uh, also uh, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and also my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So, you know, we've been covering the trial of the three white men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery. Killing took place February 23rd, 2021. And on this show, you know, we've talked about the citizen's arrest law that is at the center of at the center of this trial, the citizen's arrest law. OK, uh, welcome to the African History Network show. It is Thursday, October 28th, 2021, and we are live. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the and giving you updates uh, on what's going on in the trial of the three white men uh, accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. Uh, this trial is taking place in uh, Glenn County in Georgia. Uh, the killing took place in Brunswick, Georgia, which is a town of about 16,000 people. It's a predominantly African-American town, but the county is predominantly white. The county is about 70 percent white. At the center of uh, the trial, at the center of the trial is the citizen's arrest law uh, that uh, allows people to... Um, stop somebody or in some cases chase somebody uh if they are suspected of a felony and it really surrounded um in later years it really surrounded uh like retail theft things like this okay and there has been some talk about how this law was um uh, rooted in slavery how this law was rooted in slavery and dealt with capturing runaway slaves. All right. So we're going to deal with some of that history uh, today. This is a law that dates back to 1863 during the Civil War when Georgia was part of the Confederacy. During the Civil War, when Georgia was part of the Confederacy. So, you know, all this week we've been talking about the documentary that aired on uh, MSNBC on Sunday, October 24th called Civil War, the root of our division, Civil War, the root of our division. And we've been dealing with different aspects of that documentary and how the teaching of the Civil War and what happened the Civil War and Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, and what caused the Civil War, how that differs based upon which region of the country you grew up in. And we know that Georgia was one of those 11 states that seceded from the Union and took up arms to maintain slavery because they said it was central to their way of life and central to their wealth. Yesterday, uh, on yesterday's show, we talked about the uh, Clinton, Mississippi. Uh, I think it was yesterday. We talked about the Clinton, Mississippi massacre of 1875. And oh no, uh, no uh, that was um, Tuesday show, we talked about the Clinton, Mississippi massacre of 1875 that was uh, talked about some in the documentary. Yesterday, we dealt with how um, the myth of uh, states seceding from the union because of states' rights. OK, we dealt with that on Wednesday show. All right. So we're going to talk about the origins of this citizen's arrest law that goes back to uh, England. But in Georgia, it goes back to 1863 during the Civil War. And it was part of the uh, slave holding. It was um, um, a law dealing with uh, capturing fugitive slaves, runaway slaves. Then also uh, today, uh, President Joe Biden unveiled a one point seven five trillion dollar scaled down budget plan. OK, this is a scaled down budget plan from the three point five trillion dollar uh, spending plan. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's in the one point seven five uh, trillion dollar budget plan. What's in the one point seven five trillion dollar budget plan? It's being built as a historic spending framework, which it is 
Uh, Biden outlined the pared down $1.75 trillion plan to expand the social safety net and combat climate change after a closed door meeting with House Democrats. Uh, he said not uh, no one got everything they wanted. No one got everything they wanted, uh, including me. Uh, but that's what compromise is. That's consensus. That's what compromise is. That's that's consensus is expected that the bill is going to be voted on very soon in the next coming days. There was supposed to be a vote on the one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Uh, this evening, but Nancy Pelosi had the uh, speaker, Nancy Pelosi had to postpone that vote because there's about 30 progressive Democrats who are holding out because they want both uh, the one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill and this one point seven five uh, trillion dollar spending plan voted on at the same time. And they said they had to review the text of this new one point seven five trillion dollar spending plan, which is historic. It's um uh, for 10 years. Uh, it's historic. Also, the three point five trillion dollar spending plan was for 10 years also. So in the second portion of the day show, we'll deal with uh, what's in the uh, one point five trillion dollar spending plan. All right. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating and empowering uh, the one point seven five trillion dollar spending plan, I should say. On the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 228 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com you can sign up for our email newsletter there as well all right um and then we'll give you more information about my uh the online courses i teach on the weekend uh from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 we do that on saturdays and understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school we do that on on uh on sunday okay i, I want to jump into this first story here before we go to break so I, I have seen a number of different articles dealing with this topic. Uh, I saw one from blackamericaweb.com. We posted one from blackamericaweb.com. Uh, uh, Today, citizens arrest law used uh, to defend Ahmaud Arbery's killers is rooted in slavery. Uh, that's from blackamericaweb.com. There's, there's, a, there's a good one from uh, Reuters, okay? Reuters.com today. Uh, well, actually, October 27th, I should say. It's a good one from Reuters. Slavery era Georgia law in, fo in focus in trial of Ahmaud Arbery's killing. OK, so if we if we look at this piece here, uh, it talks about how uh, a pivotal. Uh, a pivotal defense argument. Of the three white men on trial in Georgia for the killing uh, of Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, is that they were trying to uh, make citizens arrest under civil war era law that was later repealed amid an uproar, uproar over the shooting. So this law was repealed back in about May of, uh, uh, I think it was May of this year that the law was repealed. Um, when the fatal encounter occurred on February 23rd, 2020, it was legal in Georgia for people to arrest someone where they had uh, where they had, quote, reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion, reasonable and probable grounds of suspicion that the person had just committed a felony. Outcry over the killing led to lawmakers revoking the statute in May. 
Okay, I think that was May 2021 uh, that law was revoked. Now, legal observers say prosecutors will seek to convince the jury that there was no felony over which to arrest Ahmad Aberry, who was 25 years old at the time, and that the three men lacked the, quote, reasonable and probable suspicion required under the old citizen's arrest law. The trial is in the second week of jury selection. We know and jury selection is going slower than many people want. I'm saying take your time. Don't rush this. Get the correct jury to look at the evidence and make the correct decision based upon the evidence, not social media or anything like this. We'll continue this on the other side of the break and we'll deal with this Civil War era law that dealt with fugitive slaves that is being used as a justification in killing Ahmad Arbery. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 910A on the Superstation of Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network, subscribe now. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Hotel and History Network show to deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It is laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take advice. And when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do what teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9 a.m. Superstation. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Thursday, October 28th, 2021, and we are live. Uh, call in numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment uh be sure to visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com you can register for the 10-week online course that i teach on saturdays 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch it anytime. Uh, as soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did uh, this past Saturday. Uh, the class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. It's on sale $70, actually. It's on sale $70 for a limited time only. And uh, we deal with history. We deal with some history leading up to the Civil War, starting with the Louisiana Purchase of 1830. We deal with the Dred Scott case, uh, March 6, 1857. Missouri Compromise, 1820, Compromise, 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, uh, Lincoln's uh, uh, becoming president-elect, November 1860. And we go through and uh, look at the, the Civil War, Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. Uh, we look at the Jim Crow era, World War I, Great Migration, World War II, uh, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. Okay, so visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, now, right before the break, we were talking about uh, an aspect of the Ahmad Arbery case that is gaining more uh, attention as jury selection continues. And this deals with the um, Civil War era 
citizen's arrest law that existed in Georgia and other Southern states had laws like this. All right. Uh, this law in Georgia goes back to 1863 when Georgia was part of the Confederacy. If we go back and look at this article here from um, Reuters Reuters uh, com, slavery era Georgia law in focus and trial over Ahmad Arbery's killing. And then there's a really good one from fastcompany.com that gives more background history and traces this law back to England, uh, going back to uh, the 13th century. Slavery era Georgia law in focus and trial over Ahmad Arbery's killing. All right, now, um, so we know this law has was, was repealed in May 2021, okay? But it was in effect at the time this killing took place. Before Ahmad Arbery's killing, uh, the law had been largely unchanged since it was codified in 1863. The law had been largely unchanged since it was codified in 1863 uh, when Georgia was part of the slaveholding Southern Confederacy during the Civil War. Now, when you go through it and, and watch the, the documentary Civil War, the root of our uh, division, and you look at other documentaries and other information dealing with the Civil War and Reconstruction and slavery. One of the themes in the documentary and one of the themes that we hear, uh, and we can juxtapose this to critical race theory and attack on critical race theory, is that you have a lot of white people who say, and there was one in the there was one in the documentary who said this, they acknowledged that slavery happened, they acknowledged it was wrong, but they basically said it's in the past. What do you want me to do about it? But they want to preserve Confederate monuments today that represent the past. And many of them don't want to address laws and policies that are in place that are a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, et cetera. So on the one hand, you have many people who say slavery was in the past. Yes, we acknowledge it happened, but it's there. But we want to hold on to the symbols of the Confederacy that was in the past. Also, Confeder Confederacy ended in 1865. So they want to they want to honor the Confederacy. And protect the Confederacy. And. One of the results of. Reconstruction ending. Was Southern states passing laws and rewriting their state constitutions. To suppress the African-American vote. And those laws stayed in place until uh, many of them until 1965. When, when the Voting Rights Act went into place, when the Voting Rights Act was passed. But now you have many of those same states passing voter restriction bills like Georgia and Texas to do the same thing that they rewrote their state constitutions in 1890 and 1901 as in Alabama to do, to suppress the African-American vote. So you have people on one side who says slavery happened, but that's in the past. What does that have to do with the day? But they want to hold on to the symbols of the Confederacy today. And they want to pass Jim Crow era laws today to do the same thing that they did to us after slavery ended. Before Ahmaud Arbery's killing, the law had been largely unchanged since it was codified in 1863 when Georgia was part of the slaveholding Southern Confederacy during the U.S. Civil War. The law was changed in May 2021. So when you have people who say slavery happened, but what do you want me to do about it? How about changing the oppressive laws that still exist that are a legacy of slavery that you want to ignore? When you, when you say slavery happened, what do you want us to do about it? How about changing the laws that are legacy of slavery 
okay, that are still in place today that you want to ignore. At the same time, they're passing laws in like Texas and Georgia and Southern states attacking critical race theory, which is not taught in K through 12 schools because they want to suppress how the history of slavery and systemic racism is taught and whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. Most U.S. states have codified some form of law allowing citizens arrest. Most states have codified some form of law allowing citizens arrest. The American Civil Liberties Union and others that successfully sought to repeal the law said the state's statute was originally passed to enable the capture of escaped slaves. Now, this was a law that was still on the books until May 2021. So when I when I hear people say slavery was in the past, yeah, but the legacy of slavery is right here in the present. This is this is why politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. This is why changing these laws is so important. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and others that successfully sought to repeal the Georgia citizens arrest law that went into effect in 1863 when Georgia was part of the Confederacy and they seceded from the Union to maintain slavery. The ACLU said that the Georgia citizens arrest law, that statute was originally passed to enable the capture of escaped slaves. And, and, and one thing that, that, that I find interesting, this is a recurring theme in, in the documentary, and, and I'll get the guy's name. We'll talk about this tomorrow. He, he, he was, uh, I think he was uh, Mississippi State Legislature, something like that. He said, he said he didn't own slaves. All the slaves are dead. You know, something to that effect. Slavery was wrong. It was in the past. What do you want me to do about it? <laughs> so this is the game that they run. Now, Chris Slobigan, uh, Slobigan a law professor at Tennessee, uh, Tennessee's Vander, Vanderbilt University, says citizens arrest laws put dangerous powers in untrained hands. Citizens arrest laws put dangerous powers in untrained hands. Things can get out of control quickly, he said. Now, Travis McMichael, his father, Gregory McMichael, uh, Travis McMichael was 35 at the time. His father, Gregory McMichael, was 65. And their uh, neighbor, uh, William Roddy Bryan, who said, hey, I was just along for, you know, I was just a bystander. You know, I was just, you know, but that's not what he told police on the scene. This body camera footage is what he told police on the scene. OK, he said he was trying to box a mod in using his vehicle to try to box a mod in. Uh, they say they said Ahmad Arbery was a burglar and chased him in two pickup trucks as he ran down the street in the mostly white uh, Satilla Shores, uh, a suburb of the small coastal city of Brunswick. OK, they were also some of them were also armed as well. OK, just, just, just I mean, this, this is Georgia. Georgia has the largest Confederate mon uh, monument in the country. It's called Stone Mountain. Now, just before he was cornered and shot to death, Ahmad Arbery had entered an unoccupied property where a house was under construction. But there are a number of people who entered into the property and they didn't get shot. And it's, it's on video, it's on security uh, camera footage, surveillance footage, and the owner of the property where the construction is going on turned over the surveillance footage to authorities there's been a number of people who just wandered on look around say hey what's going on guys blah 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 they didn't get hunt, hunted down they didn't get shot the owner of the property has said nothing was taken and that Ahmad Arbery who was on a Sunday afternoon job probably just stopped there for a drink of water One of the defense attorneys says citizens arrest is a big part of our case. A big part of our case, Kevin Gow, 
who also wanted the protesters removed from outside the Glen County courthouse. And he, and they and because he, he he felt that they would duly uh, wrong wrongfully influence the uh, jury and the jury uh, selection process. Kevin Giles said in the interview earlier this month before the judge presiding over the murder trial in Glen County Superior Court issued a partial gag order. Uh, Kevin Giles admitted they changed the law but change the citizens arrest law, but changing the law doesn't affect us. It doesn't change what was the law of the land at the time, end quote. One could argue that was the law of the Confederacy because uh, that was when George was part of the Confederacy. Now, one would have to look, one would have to ask the question, okay, wait a second. Now, we know during the Confederacy, they had like Confederate money, and the Confederacy set up their own constitution. Well, that constitution is eradicated. Does a does a law that Georgia set up when they were has seceded from the Union and were traitors to the Union and joined the Confederacy? Does that law still really apply today? Or before they repealed it, does, does that is that law still really in effect? Once you, I mean, that's a that's a good legal question that to ask. It's like, wait a second, the um, the Confederacy dissolved. Okay. The Confederacy dissolved. The Confederate money is no good. So if you set up, if you have a law that's that's designed to, it was targeting rental slaves. Well, slavery ended in 1865 and the Confederacy ended in 1865. So is this law really legitimate? So if we look at... Um, there's a good article from uh, so read the rest of this read the rest of this piece here from Reuters.com uh, and then also uh, Ira Robbins a law professor at American University in Washington wrote in an academic paper uh, that many states many states citizens arrest laws are broad in California, for example, someone can make an arrest for a felony if the person has probable cause to believe it was committed. While re while recruiting citizens, while recruiting citizens to aid in eradicating crime is a noble idea, Ira, Ira Robbins said or wrote, strict safeguards are needed to prevent the law from being abused. New York state has the strictest law holding residents liable for false arrest if no crime was committed, even if they had reasonable, reasonable belief, quote, leaving no room for mistakes. In Georgia, the elected county prosecutor who first looked at the Ahmaud Arbery case accepted the citizen's arrest rationale offered by the three white men and concluded they should not be arrested according to Glen County police, according to Glen County police. Okay. That was uh, Jackie Johnson. Now the decision drew outrage after May 5th, when a cell phone video, so it'd be May 5th, 2020 after a cell phone video recorded by uh, William Roddy Bryan showing the men chasing and killing Ahmaud Arbery was published by a local news outlet and quickly spread online. All right, read the rest. Of, read the rest of this uh, article. Uh, name of this one here from Reuters is "Slavery Era Georgia Law in Focus in Trial Over Ahmaud Arbery's Killing." All right, now I, I want to go quickly to uh there was a good uh article from blackamericaweb.com and i monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis so i see uh all of these articles um there was a good one from blackamericaweb.com called ahmaud arbery's it's called citizens arrest law used to defend ahmaud arbery's killers is rooted in slavery citizens arrest law um used to defend Ahmaud Arbery's killers is rooted in slavery. The Civil War era statute was finally repealed in May 
after well over a century of being on the books in Georgia. But I thought slavery was over with. So you, you have to ask the question, wait a second, channel slavery ended in 1865. This law went into effect in 1863 in Georgia. And it was it was uh, geared around targeting runaway slaves. So why is the law still on the books? It's slave, it, it chattel slavery ended 156 years ago. Why is the law still on the books? And I would ask the question, wait a second. If they, if this law went into effect when Georgia was in secession and they were committing treason against the union, is this law still valid? So in this article, they talk about, um, This war era statute was finally repealed. It, uh, beyond being outdated, the citizens arrest law has roots in slave patrols of the late 1600s. Okay. Enacted in 1863, possibly as a response to the Emancipation Proclamation, which was Janu January 1st, 1863. Uh, Georgia's law was created to capture enslaved people running away to join the Union Army. This law was designed to capture runaway slaves who were running away to join the Union Army. Opponents argue the law enabled vigilante justice targeting African-Americans. Okay, so there's a link here that takes you to uh, this excellent article from FastCompany.com. This piece from FastCompany.com gives an in-depth history on this fugitive slave law and it goes back to the 13th century in England. The troubling history, now the name of this article from fastcompany.com is called The Troubling History of Citizens' Arrests from Slave Patrols to Ahmad Arbery to ICE. Okay? From Slave Patrols to Ahmad Arbery to ICE. Not vanilla ICE, but they're talking about customs, border and customs ICE. Okay? Um, one once viewed as a key part of civic engagement, citizens arrest in America are now archaic, potentially violent and targeted against minorities. Yet the laws allowing men remain on the books. So if you, if you, so first thing you say, oh, well, slavery ended, that was a long time ago, blah, blah, blah. What do you want me to do about it? Well, besides repairing the damage of slavery reparations i've always said part of repairing the damage part of reparations is changing the laws that inflicted the damage in the first place you have to change these laws that are still on the books so there's a piece here that deals with the history of citizens arrest and their racial roots the history of citizens arrest and their racial roots now citizens arrest were first officially mentioned in the statute of Winchester, not Rochester, not Jack Benny, Rochester, but Winchester. Okay. <laughs> I'm an old radio show fan. All right. <laughs> not Jack, not Jack Benny <laughs> in Rochester. Okay. <laughs> Citizens arrest were first officially mentioned in the statute of Winchester in 1285 AD. When King Edward I explicitly instructed citizens to join the night watch, to join the night watch and take part in, quote unquote, hue and cry, H-U-E, hue and cry, which was public outcry and pursuit when a fellow citizen is suspected of a crime. OK, this citizen's arrest dates back to the 13th century A.D. in England. Now, quote, until they be taken and delivered to the sheriff, end quote, until they be taken and delivered to the sheriff, end quote. Now, this community justice became an important part of keeping law and order in England when it was impossible for peace officers to enforce the law alone. Th that then became an important tenet of the early Anglo-American there their word, Anglo-American, idea of liberty, says Jason Opal, O-P-A-L, a professor of history at McGill University. Now, Anglo, now, so you do with Anglo-Saxons, 
okay? Anglos and Saxons were two groups of Germanic people, also known as barbarians, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, the Picts, the Allens, the Franks. And they were groups of barbarians that, that built kingdoms. And then from kingdoms, you have countries that are built. So the Franks, uh, uh, France is named after the Franks. England is named after the Anglos because the Anglos and the Saxons come here in 1607, two groups of Germanic people, the Anglos and the Saxons, they, their descendants come here, but England is named after the Anglos. The Anglos, the Saxons and the Jutes, they also go into um, Ireland and they conquer Ireland. Ireland becomes the first colony of England uh, as about 12th century AD. Now, involvement in community justice was a healthy means to ward off the threat of martial law and state oppression. Involvement in community justice was a healthy means to ward off the threat of martial law and state oppression. Only the state could ultimately punish wrongdoers, but ordinary people enjoyed the right of uh, posse comitatus, comitatus, okay, P-O-S-S-E, -S -E, posse comitatus, whereby they were deputized by sheriffs for the general good of the public, hence the word a posse. Like the old Western movies, you, you go round up a posse and deputize them to sheriff, deputizes, deputizes them, or uh, uh, the U.S. Marshal deputizes them and go get your rifle, go get your Winchester, we're going to go catch them, okay, hence the word a posse. Now, as European colonizers brought the law to the Americas, quote, this liberal tradition took a horrifying turn, said uh, Professor Opal, Professor Jason Opal, as it united the vigilantism, often racist, as it united with vigilantism, often, often racist. Now, in 1661, in Barbados, and Barbados was a colony of Great Britain. In 1661, in Barbados, Barbados passed the first slave code, which among a slew of other regulations required slaves, enslaved Africans, who were away from the plantation to hold passes from their masters and allowed any white man to stop them and ask to view those passes. Because we know that the, um, uh, the enslavement of Africans in the Caribbean, in these British colonies in the Caribbean influences slavery here. What, wasn't no fictitious Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch never historically existed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in a documentary dealing with uh, die Willie Lynch die or something like that. Uh, Willie Lynch never historically existed. The Willie Lynch letter of 1712 has been proven to be a fraud and uh, Dr. Kwabina Ashanti uh, came out some years ago and admitted the, the letter was a fraud. It was written about 1970. Willie Lynch never his historically existed. Throw the Willie Lynch letter in the garbage. Okay, and, and study real history. Right now, and I've done lectures and Professor Manu M. Pim is an expert on the, on, the, on the fake Willie Lynch letter. He's written essays. I've interviewed Professor Manu M. Pim a few times here on, on, on this show dealing with this, dealing with uh, the history, but also the Willie Lynch letter. So this also allowed any white man to stop them and ask to view those passes. Now, separately, the slave code in, in Barbados in 1661 established slave patrols. Separately, the slave code in Barbados in 1661 established slave patrols in which white men actively prowled for escaped slaves. The posse comitatus shifted from a public good to grounds for, quote, chasing a runaway, said Professor Opal. Now, now this is a um, this is a uh, depiction here, a woodcut from the abolitionist anti-slavery almanac of 1839, and it depicts uh, the capture of a fugitive slave by a slave patrol. Okay, I'm not sure which uh, state this is, 
but this is uh, Anti-Slavery Almanac 1839. So this is the Underground Railroad starts about 1831. This is before the Civil War that doesn't start until 1861. At this point in time, the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act is in is in place. The uh, Fugitive Slave Act from 1850 that became that was part of the uh, Compromise of 1850, which consisted of five bills. We talked about the Compromise of 1850 on yesterday's show. Um, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was part of the Compromise of 1850. This is before this. This is 1839. OK, so you're still operating based upon the Fugitive Slave Act of, of 1793. And also there was a business of going into free territory ca capturing even free African-Americans who may have been born free or what have you. Or if they were former slaves, bought their way out of freedom, they were le they were legally free. There, there was a business of capturing them and taking them into slavery. We saw this with uh, uh the, the movie 12 Years a Slave, which was the, uh, based on the true story of Solomon Northrop, who was a free African-American who's captured, taken into slavery, his freedom papers taken away, things like this. And he's enslaved for 12 years. And there's going to be abolitionists that actually help rescue him. Now, South Carolina was the first place in what is now the United States to set up its slave code in 1691. OK. So we go from Barbados in 1661, which was a British colony, to South Carolina in 1691. And South Carolina is going to be the first. Uh, well, it's, a, it's still colonies here. We don't have states at this time. This is before the Declaration of Independence in 1776, before the American Revolutionary War, which starts in 1775. South Carolina was the first place in what is now the U.S. to set up its slave code in 1691 before the practice spread to other areas of the 13 colonies. Also, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union, December 20th, 1860, and South Carolina is where the Civil War started, April 12, 1861. South Carolina is like really, really crucial to the history of this country. At this point, quote, it's all about race, said Professor Jason Opal. It's entirely about the new liberty of white men in the Americas to detain black people. It's entirely about the new liberty of white men in the Americas to detain black people. Today, those exercising, uh, today those exercising their arresting rights have quote, all the benefits of the British liberal tradition along with the violent privileges of American slavery. All the benefits of British liberal tradition, along with the violent privileges of American slavery. Now, in the years since, structured police forces have developed, leaving less need for citizens arrest. Still, as cases around the country emerged, courts began to provide more detail to guide private citizens, writes Ira Robbins, a law professor at American University in an extensive paper about citizens' arrests in 2016. Through the 19th and 20th centuries, the 1800s and 1900s, some state courts explicitly codified citizens' arrest laws. Other states still rely on common law precedents. Other states still rely on common law precedents. Now, most versions remain vague and open to interpretation. Some states allow citizens arrest only for felonies. Some states allow for citizens arrest for misdemeanors, misdemeanors and some for any quote, breach of peace, end quote. In Arkansas, for existence, the law, call, the law only calls for quote, reasonable grounds for believing, end quote, that a person committed a felony. In Illinois, uh, almost anything is fair game for an arrest except an ordinance violation. In Maine, the state of Maine, citizens can arrest for lesser crimes only if they saw them committed, but for more serious crimes, probable cause is enough. Now, this creates an array of problems, said, I, uh, said law professor Ira Roberts. Many citizens do not comprehend the parameters of their authority. Many citizens do not comprehend the parameters of their authority. 
even if the citizen has good intentions, if the arresting citizens are wrong, they are potentially liable for false arrest and imprisonment or use of excessive force and can be sued, especially in states like New York that put the burden of proof on the arrestor. States like New York that put the burden of proof on the arrestor, the person doing the arrest. Now, it also opens up the door to abuse of power and the risk of people carrying out personal vendettas. Law professor Ira Robbins cites multiple cases of torture. Quote, one arrestor detained the suspect, bound him, hung him from his feet and struck him while he was questioned about items missing from a shop, from a store. End quote. Now, in this case, the court charged the arrestor with false imprisonment for administ administering vigilante justice. All right. Um, we're almost out of time here on 910 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Um, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes here. And uh, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Uh, one, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the uh, 10 week online course, uh, courses. I teach two of them. On Saturday, it's from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we go through a lot of the history here. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We do that class uh, class on uh, Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then uh, you can also support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, I'll be on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. We'll talk about that on tomorrow's show. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behaviors. Not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace. Okay, everybody stand by. Uh, we're going to keep going for a couple, for a couple more minutes because I've got to get out of here. How's everybody doing? All right. So who, who has heard this information before? Because um, you know the methods are not true. That's part of the problem. The methods in the, the method, a lot of those methods laid out in the Willie Lynch letter are not true. This is why when you go research Professor Manua Pim's information, you'll see that. This is why we have to study real history. We're operating based upon a whole lot of myth, a whole lot of nonsense, and don't understand real history. This is this 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 is part of the problem. OK, and, 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 and how are you going to correct a problem when you don't even understand the origin of the problem? Um, all right. So. We have that. Um, who has not heard this information dealing with the origins of the citizens arrest laws? All right, let's post post this here. Okay, let's continue. And then I want to get into uh, the $1.75 trillion uh, spending plan that Joe Biden unveiled today. We'll deal with that a little bit today. We'll talk about that more tomorrow because um, I have a lot of work to do. Okay, let's. I want to go back to this piece here from uh, Fast Company. The troubling history of citizens arrest slave patrols, citizens arrest from slave patrols to Ahmad Arbery to ICE. All right, let's continue. Uh, I'm just going to deal with this article because this is a, this is a long article, but it's just another section here that I want to look at and you can read the rest of it. Okay, now, when citizens arrest straight into vigilantism, when citizens arrest straight into vigilantism is concerning and it's an easy line to cross in the modern day said law professor Ira Robbins. Um, 
Ira Roberts is particularly concerned with, quote, private citizen volunteer watch groups like the New York founded Guardian Angels and the Extreme Justice League, an armed patrol group that keeps, quote, eyes and ears, end quote, on the streets of San Diego, all while wearing superhero costumes. Now, in the United States today, in the, in the, in the U.S., today's citizens arrests have also been made more dangerous by the prevalence of firearms by the prevalence of firearms because um going back to the 13th century when going back to 1285 uh, ad in the statute of winchester you ain't have firearms back then the in in, in england they didn't have firearms first firearm is, is is um is is manufactured is right around 1346 ad in the 14th century so the 13th century statute of winchester did require citizens to carry arms it commanded that every man have in his house in in his house harness for to keep the peace but the text notes lances knives uh falces and gisarms both which were both curved sickle like agricultural tools the statute didn't know firearms because they ain't have them back at that at that time in in 1285 slave patrolling militias were also required to be armed giving them powers that are unthinkable in britain unthinkable in the liberal tradition that it otherwise mimics said uh, uh professor jason opal today deadly force is still permitted in some states adaptations of citizens arrest laws south carolina's law reads that uh in certain cases a citizen may arrest a person in the nighttime by efficient means even if the life of the person should be taken, end quote. Now, in 1989, a Michigan court decided not to curtail a citizen's right to kill a fleeing felon. Quote, it, it is regrettable, but sometimes necessary to make use of deadly force, end quote. The court wrote because, quote, the police cannot be everywhere they are needed at once, end quote. Now, I don't know if this law in Michigan is still on the books dealing with killing a fleeing felon. I don't know, this was 1989. I don't know if it's still on the books now. Now, Professor uh, Jason Opal said that guns have become a totem of white privilege, a totem of white privilege, a singular right that many feel has been lost since the civil rights era. Racist elements now combine with, spe with specific gun rights, such as stand your ground laws present in 27 states. And Florida was the first state to have stand your ground laws. Florida was also the first state to have uh, poll taxes as well in 1889. That's Florida as well. And Florida was one of the few states where uh for felony felony disenfranchisement you lost your voting rights for life if you were convicted of a felony so um stand your ground laws are present in 27 states which allow people to use lethal force uh if they feel threatened regardless if they are able to retreat and counsel doctrines which allow them to shoot uh to kill a trespasser on their property in the name of self-defense now this law led to uh the killing of uh, trayvon martin by george zimmerman a neighborhood watch coordinator he, he wasn't part of the national organization the neighborhood watch which is governed by the national sheriff's association because they did research and they said this guy is not part of neighbor like neighborhood watch is an actual national organization okay so he was neighborhood watch coordinator he was uh but he wasn't part of the national organization because they said 
they did research and they said we don't have any record of this person being a member of our organization because part of neighborhood watch is they tell you 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 don't go uh chase down people in neighborhood watch they they aren't they are not armed either but they tell you you don't go chase down people you go report you look you watch and you report you don't go chasing people um so we know it was found justifiable in court and the, and the prosecutor didn't even want to prosecute the case there in in uh in florida that prosecutor was later defeated because that prosecutor was elected prosecutor was later defeated in a, in a, a subsequent uh election such laws can lead to groups like the boogaloo boys a mysterious far white far right posse often described as vigilantes who have deputized themselves to patrol Black Lives Matter protests and marches with assault rifles. All right, read the rest of this article because um, I don't have time to get through the rest of it. It's like two more pages or at least one more page. But this gives some background information on these citizens arrest laws, which are um, in this country largely uh, especially in Southern states, a legacy of slavery, which need to be changed. The troubling history of citizens arrests from slave patrols to Ahmad Arbery to ICE. This is a um, piece from uh, July 20th, 2020 from uh, fastcompany.com. All right. Okay, I want to uh, go to this next story here. Let's shift gears. We'll deal with this for a minute. The $1.75 trillion uh, budget plan, spending plan, was unveiled today, a, re a revised one. And I said, it was, I, I said, look, the $3.5 trillion, uh, and, and apparently, according to Biden, all 50 Democrats in the Senate agree to this, including Manchin and Cinema. I said, look, the 3.5 trillion, first of all, this is going to pass. Th this, bill is, this bill is going to pass, okay? The $3.5 trillion spending plan was for 10 years. I said before, look, if you cut it in half, you have 1.75. Senator Joe Manchin said he, he, he would come in around 1.5 trillion. This is 1.75. This is for, for 10 years. Some programs you can cut and fund them for four or five years and then come back in four or five years and renew it. Because 3.5 trillion, that was for 10 years. That wasn't one year. So th th this is going this is going to pass. Uh, and it's also important to note because people freak out and things like this. Oh, my God. What is this? Well, like, you, you do realize it took 18 months to get the Affordable Health Care Act passed, right? The ACA, Obamacare, it took 18 months to get that passed. So that's why you haven't seen me freak out about this. I've been involved in writing public policy for the city for the city of Detroit. It took us 13, 13 months to write uh, Executive Order 22 or rewrite it. So I have, I have some understanding of this process. And that was in the city. It took 13 months for that. So this they're going to they're going to get this done in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, this to get passed. But if we look quickly here. Uh, what's in the bill. So there's a good, uh, there's a good piece here from the Washington post. And we'll talk some more about this tomorrow. Here's what's in the $1.75 trillion Biden budget plan that no, that no Republicans support just so people understand. Okay. People that don't follow like politics every day. You, we deal with this pretty much every day here on this show. No Republicans support this bill. No Republicans in the house are going to vote for this. No Republicans in the House or the Senate voted for the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan that that has the uh, earned uh, uh, childhood tax credit in it that is basically cutting childhood poverty in half and benefiting a lot of African-American children and their parents. No Republicans in the House or Senate voted for that bill, just so people understand. The $46.5 billion in rental assistance for renters and landlords was in that $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan that no Republicans in the House or the Senate voted for. Taxes, climate, health care, and child care 
would all see sub substantial changes if Democrats approve this package. Um, I want to go to, we're going to go to this clip here from NBC Nightly News. And uh, this is talking about uh, unveiling this package. And we'll deal with a little bit what's in it. And we'll talk about this some more tomorrow. They, talk, uh, they talked about it on Roland Martin and Filter today. He had uh, William Spriggs on, who's an African-American economist. So they did a really good segment of Roland Martin and Filter. I'll be on Roland Martin and Filter. should be on tomorrow. They wanted me on the show on, what was it, Tuesday's producer contacted me. I was, I was too busy. I was behind schedule and busy as hell. I could not do Tuesday. But my, I'm normally on on Friday, so I said I, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't do Tuesday, but I'll, I'll be on on Friday. All right, let's go. While this is queuing up, um, let's see here. Okay, everybody, share this broadcast on social media platforms. And if you have any questions, post them here quickly. Who still needs to register for the uh, classes I teach on the weekends? Uh, Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school and from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. While we wait on this clip to load, uh, there was also a good article here from NBC News that I read today. Biden urges Democrats to uh, accept uh, compromise on latest big social spending plan. OK, now, the other thing that's important to ask yourself is. Where are the Republicans spending plan? What are Republicans proposing? Because they don't have one. They don't have one. And none of, none of them are going to vote for this. Calling the moment an inflection point, the president urged his party to accept the compromise. Uh, and, by, and Biden said nobody gets everything that they want, which is true. Uh, Biden unveiled a new framework Thursday for sweeping uh, Thursday for a sweeping social safety net package that includes money for child care that many Republicans are against. Includes money for child care and climate change, beginning an uphill struggle to convince Leary lawmakers who have watched their priorities dwindle from the package. These are the progressives. OK, the progressives. And they're going to end up going along with this bill because it's like, OK. If. Democrats lose the House and the Senate. What bill you think you're going to be able to get passed then? If Democrats lose the House and the Senate, you're not going to be able to get anything passed. No Republicans support these bills. The best thing to do is pass this, then come back after the 2022 midterm elections. And in the 2022 midterm elections, you run on this bill and what you got passed, the House helping people, and the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan and House helping people. And then you can deal with the Department of Justice and uh, uh, restarting the investigations into the patterns and practices, police departments and things like this. You can deal with what's what's taking place in the different the, the Department of uh, Education and discharging student loan debt and all this. You can deal with all that. But you, you run on these two bills here that no Republicans voted for. And then also by then they'll, they'll, they would have passed a one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill that is about 18 and 19 Republicans in the Senate that voted for the bill. Now, this is at the same time that Republicans are going to run on critical race theory, banning books. OK, Republicans are going to run on critical race theory, banning books and uh, uh, fair, uh, 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 voter suppression bills. OK, that's that's what they're going to run on. Democrats are going to run on these bills here. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but I study this daily. I sure as hell ain't stupid. They're going to they're going to run on these bills. We are at an inflection point. Let me close this out here. Hold on. OK. We are at an inflection point, Biden told uh, House Democrats on Thursday in a closed door meeting, according to a source familiar with the uh, hour long meeting. The rest of the world wonders whether we can function. The rest of the world wonders whether we can function. If Biden is successful in passing this proposal and his $550, uh, $550 billion infrastructure plan, which is really part of a, a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, 
Congress will have enacted $5 trillion in spending in the 10 months since he took office. And overwhelmingly, Republicans didn't vote for these bills. If Biden is successful with this, Congress will have enacted $5 trillion in spending in the 10 months since Biden took office, a historic level of new domestic spending. Remember under Trump, every other week was infrastructure, infrastructure week and no infrastructure bill got passed. Biden told Democrats in presenting the parameters of the package today, according to the source, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that House and Senate majorities and my presidency will be determined by what happens in the next. He made the case for the legislation in remarks just before leaving on his trip to Europe. Okay, now the newest proposal amounts to 1.75 trillion down from the original 3.5 trillion. He basically cut it in half. Now, some of the things have been taken out that you can come back and get later. Uh, it's, uh, it includes priorities like funding for climate change, child care, and universal preschool. It relies on new taxes, including one aimed at uh, millionaires and billionaires, but it omits many Democratic priorities like paid family leave and free community college because people like Joe Manchin wouldn't vote for it. But see, what you do is we have to understand long term strategy. You run on these two major bills that you get passed in the um, one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill. You run on that in the 2022 midterm elections because Republicans are going to run on critical race theory, banning books and suppressing votes. Then in 2023. You come back and you in, in 2023. The 10, the 10 um, Senate races that Democrats can win, that Republicans are in office. If you go from 50 Democrats in the Senate to 55, do you realize you can nullify the votes of Manchin and Sinema? If you go from 50 Democrats in the Senate, to 55, even if Manchin and Sinema vote against bills, you can nullify the votes because then you can have, and especially if you vote in the right, the, the, the right Democrats, not, not somebody else like Manchin, but Manchin is better than most Republicans because if you study Manchin's voting records, these bills he votes for, most of these bills, Republicans don't even vote for. That's why I was listening to Reverend Al Sharpton's radio show today and people were calling in saying, uh, there's a rumor that Joe Manchin is going to leave the Democratic Party, go to the Republican Party. They're misunderstanding that article from Rolling Stone written by David Korn. What it, what it said was that Manchin floated the idea of, of, of thinking about leaving the Democratic Party and becoming an independent. It never said he was going to join the Republican Party, because if you actually look at the bills that Manchin votes for, just like you look at it, look at his bill, the Freedom to Vote Act. The, the, the Freedom to Vote Act, okay, that he largely wrote along with Senator Raphael Warnock and others. No Republicans in the Senate voted to even move to the next step for debate on the bill. So even though he's a he's a moderate conservative Democrat, and I disagree with him on a number of policies, the bills he votes for, Republicans consistently vote against. There's no place for Manchin in the Republican Party. If you actually understand politics, there's no place for Manchin in the Republican Party. If you think he's an outcast in the Democratic Party, dude, th there's no place for him in the Republican Party. He, he's, he supported the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. No Republicans in the House. 212 Republicans in the House voted against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. That passed March 3rd, 2021. He supports the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. In August 2021, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed the U.S. House of Representatives by vote of 219 to, to, to 211. 211 Republicans, basically all the Republicans voted against the bill. So as much as I dislike Joe Manchin, I'd rather have him than a Republican in that seat. Because the bills he keeps voting for, that we advocate for, Republicans consistently vote against. 
But in twenty in the twenty twenty two midterm elections, if Democrats go from fifty in the Senate to fifty five, you can nullify the votes of Manchin and Cinema, because you can do uh, you can alter the filibuster with fifty one votes. And so far, now they may go for Manchin and Cinema may go for returning the filibuster back to a standing filibuster, because today is too easy. The filibuster, you can just call in from the country club or what have you and do it. It wasn't always like that. And the filibuster, you know, is not part of the Constitution, came into existence about 1917. But it used to be a standing filibuster, a talking filibuster, which is much harder to do. You have to hold the floor and try to galvanize support and convince people of your uh, perspective. Today is, is too easy and the onus is on the majority to then try to break the filibuster. It's too easy for the minority to use it. And then also, as we talked about here on this show, going back to the town hall meeting that Joe Biden did with Don Lemon maybe four months ago. Joe Biden said then he was he 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 was for going back to a standing filibuster like it used to be in the Senate. So I was listening to Reverend Al Sharpton show today and there's a couple of people calling him like, I don't know where the hell they get this nonsense from that Joe Manchin is talking about becoming a Republican. No, he's not. And then when he was confronted by reporters about the article from Rolling Stone that David Korn wrote, he said it was BS, but then he changed later, like the next day, he, he changed his stance and said that if, uh, something to the effect, if uh, they couldn't come to an agreement on the spending plan or something like that, he would consider uh, leaving the Democratic Party, but becoming, he would register as an independent, okay? One week he would send a letter to Senator Chuck Schumer, the next week, he would register as an independent. Now it did not say in the article whether he would caucus with the Democrats or Republicans as Senator Angus King of Maine and Senator Bernie Sanders of, of Vermont are both independents, but they caucus with the Democrats. It didn't say in the letter, but if you, if you look at Joe Biden's policy, if you look at Joe Manchin's politics and the votes and what he votes for Republicans consistently vote against that. It was nothing. It was nothing in that article that even hinted that Joe Manchin would caucus with Republicans. So I don't know where people are getting this nonsense from. The, the bad thing about it was Reverend Al Sharpton didn't even correct them with the nonsense they were talking about. I don't, so, okay. I don't know. Um, it relies on new taxes, including one aimed at millionaires and billionaires, but it omits many democratic Priorities like paid, paid, paid family leave, which is important. Free community college, which is important. You can come back and get that in 2023. Get the 1.75 trillion passed now. Get the infrastructure bill passed now. Run on, run on these three major bills: American Rescue Plan, infrastructure, and the human infrastructure, the spending plan. Run on, run on that, and then you explain to people how parts of this bill are helping them. And how will help them? Because about three months ago, Mitch McConnell was in Kentucky, his home state, and he was talking to Kentuckians, and he was telling them that four billion dollars was coming to Kentucky from the American Rescue Plan, the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan. Then, the next sentence, he had to admit he didn't vote for the bill, but he's telling them how it's going to help you in Kentucky. All right, now uh, let's go to this. I'm going to go to this clip here. And I don't know why this thing did. Okay, let's try to get this queued up. Stand by. His multi trillion dollar spend, struggling with Democratic divisions over his multi trillion dollar spending plans. This morning, President Biden unveiling a new framework and urging Democrats to get his agenda back on track. After months of tough and thoughtful negotiations, I think we have an historic, I know we have a historic economic framework. 
delaying his departure for key summits in Europe, the president first traveled to Capitol Hill. A source familiar with the meeting said he warned Democrats behind closed doors. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the House and Senate majorities and my presidency will be determined by what happens in the next week. Back at the White House, the president made his case. No one got everything they wanted, including me. That's what compromise is. That's consensus. And that's what I ran on. The price tag of the social policy and climate plan, $1.75 trillion. It includes funding for universal pre-K, elder care, and a one-year extension of the enhanced child tax credit. But to cut the price tag down, many items were dropped, including free community college, prescription drug reform, and paid family and medical leave, a key proposal the president had been touting just last week. We're one of the few industrial countries in the world that does not have paid leave. Progressives had demanded a framework on the social spending and climate plan before they would support the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And tonight, some blasting the president's proposal, saying there were too many cuts. Clearly, to my mind, it has some major gaps in it. I felt a little bamboozled because this was not this was not what I thought was coming today. Many progressives saying they still don't trust moderate oh, holdouts, Senators Kirsten yes. Cinema and Joe Manchin who today suggested the price tag was not too high. We negotiated a good, uh, a good number that we worked off of. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi still not saying when she'll call a vote. We had the text out there uh, on a path to get this all done. And Kristen, we just learned Democrats won't even hold a vote until next week. That's right, and we still don't know if those key moderate senators, Manchin and Cinema, will commit to support the framework. Democrats can't lose a single vote in the Senate, with Republicans opposing what they say is a massive spending plan that will raise prices and hurt the economy. All right, so but Republicans don't even have a counter bill to like push. They're not. They don't. They don't support largely any of these bills. While they while some of them try to um, talk a revisionist history of January 6th insurrection and others uh, talk about critical race theory and things like this. It's not even taught in K through 12 schools. So if we look very quickly here at, um, and I was trying to pull up this other, argument. we're going to look very quickly here. At what's in it? Just some bullet points here. Um, I was trying to pull up this uh, piece here from Rolling Stone. Where is it? Uh, it was one from Rolling Stone. I think it was, uh, it may have been Mother Jones, uh, David Korn from Mother Jones. Let me see, let me look at this, hold on. David Korn, yes, yeah, from Mother Jones. Manchin tells associates he's considering leaving the Democratic Party and has an exit plan, okay? Manchin ain't going nowhere. Are you right now? Manchin, and he sure as hell ain't going to the Republican Party. Um, so read this here from Mother Jones. I don't have time to get into this. October 20th, 2021. I knew it was David Korn. I was thinking Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone had another big article. But this one here, uh, David Korn wrote this for Mother Jones. Manchin tells associates he's considering leaving the Democratic Party and, and has an exit plan. He could pull the trigger if he doesn't get his way on the Build Back Better bill. Manchin, confronted by um, reporters, said it's BS. OK, and I'm telling you now, he ain't, he's not leaving. He sure as hell ain't going to the Republican Party. And you and people uh, hopefully people understand that if Manchin were to go to the Republican Party, you do realize that Mitch McConnell will be back in control of the Senate because it'd be 51, 49 Republicans. Mitch McConnell will become Senate Majority Leader and they'll shut down all, all these bills. Uh, read this one here, but this is not going to happen from Mother Jones. This is a good article, but it's not going to happen. Now, Let's look at this uh, Washington Post. Here's what's in the one point seven five trillion dollar uh, uh, Biden budget plan. President Biden on Thursday unveiled a roughly one point seven five trillion dollar blueprint for overhauling the country's health care, climate, education and tax laws as he seeks to break a logjam 
among his party's liberals and moderates that has stalled his economic agenda for months. I'm still waiting to see the Republicans health care plan. Their climate change plan. Their education plan, besides cracking down on critical race theory and banning it. I, I, I still want to see that from Republicans. The plan includes some of Biden's earliest policy priorities, including new spending to enhance child care and offer pre-kindergarten uh, free to all American families. But it also shells some of Democrats' uh, uh, most favored plans, including an effort to provide paid leave to millions of workers, one of the many, one of the many casualties in the party's efforts to reduce its original uh, $3.5 trillion price tag because Manson said his number was about $1.5 trillion. They come in at $1.75. Apparently, Manson has come up okay, to $1.75 trillion. So we see clean energy and climate investments of $555 billion. Now, this is over 10 years, just as the $3.5 trillion bill was over 10 years. It wasn't all one year. So when people say, oh, this is going to increase inflation, it's like, wait a second, hold on. First of all, this is um, over 10 years, one, two, this is not like cash in people's hands that they go and spend. That's necess the majority of it. So what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, I don't understand. This is going to, um, increase inflation, child care and preschool, 400 billion child tax and earned income tax credits, 200 billion, the child, the child tax, uh, income credits that is, ba that is basically cut childhood poverty in half, which is part of the $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. This has a one year extension in the, in, uh, in the bill. And the hope is, is to then extend it again after that, but they eventually want to make this permanent. But in this bill, they have a one year extension. No Republicans support that either. No Republicans support, support the, the, uh, childhood tax, uh, and, and uh, earned income tax credits. ACA premium, America, uh, uh, Affordable uh, Health Care Act uh, premium subsidies and the Medicaid gap, $130 billion. Uh, home care, $150 billion. Okay, let me grab this article here. I printed this one up from, I printed it up from NBC News. Okay. Uh, home care, $150 billion. Housing, $150 billion. Equity and other investments, $90 billion. Higher education. And workforce, forty billion, Medicare, uh, uh, a Medicare hearing, uh, thirty-five billion, and immigration, a hundred billion. If we go through and look at this, uh, let me see. Do we have a breakdown? We have a quick breakdown. What about this some more tomorrow? Um, Biden presented the plan on Capitol Hill in a private meeting with House Democrats earlier on Thursday, October twenty-eighth. After which, many Democrats said they were still negotiating its specifics and haggling over what's in and out of the package. He still must convince lawmakers, including Senators uh, Manchin and Cinema, who helped drive Democrats scale back, Democrats to scale back their policy ambitions in the first place. But Biden is basically saying he has 50 Democrats in the Senate on, on board on this. So they break through what's in uh, health care, uh, Extension until 2025 of expanded premium subsidies for most Americans who purchase health uh, health care plans through the Affordable Care Act marketplaces as begun in the spring through the American Rescue Plan. Allow until 2025 low income people in a dozen states that have not expanded Medicaid to buy ACA health plans without paying a monthly premium, which has helped a lot of African-Americans living in states like Georgia, because there are 12 states that did not do the Medicaid expansion. They, they're, they're, they're mainly Southern states like Georgia that did not do the Medicaid expansion. Expansion of Medicare benefits for older Americans to include hearing benefits, hearing aids, different things like this, hearing benefits, expansion of Medicare uh, benefits is 35 billion for that 150 billion for an expansion of home and community based services for older Americans, older people and people with disabilities 
less than 400 billion Biden initially proposed for this purpose, but is 150 billion more than you have now. What's in the plan for families? Some of the most some of the most ambitious and expanse and, and, and expensive plans put forward by the Biden administration seek to ease the financial burdens facing millions of Americans, particularly low income parents with children. The White House described the investments as the most transformative proposal targeting caregiving in generations, pointing to a slew of new programs and tax credits that date back to some of Biden's earliest campaign promises. Universal free pre-kindergarten for all three and four year olds, which the White House has described as the largest expansion in such education programs since the creation of public high school roughly a century ago. You know, hopefully you, you can all see this. I know people are watching on different devices, so I want to make this really easy to see. The pre the pre kindergarten effort is part of a broader four hundred billion dollar bucket of funds to help Americans afford child care to help Americans afford child care, aiming to ensure families who earn less than three hundred thousand dollars annually spend no more than seven percent of their income on child care for kids under six years old. Now, this is going to help a lot of African-American parents also, in case people are wondering. This is, this is going to help a lot of African-American parents also. Uh, a one-year extension of expanded refundable child tax credits, which will continue to be paid out on a monthly basis in people's banks, bank accounts, if they have direct deposit, continuing a pandemic-era relief program. The child, the childhood tax credits, the child tax credits, which have basically cut child poverty in half. And that was part of the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan that no Republicans voted for, even though it benefited people that a lot of poor white people that voted for Republicans. It benefited them, but. No Republicans in the House or the Senate voted for the bill. Roughly one hundred and fifty billion dollars to construct rehab and make available roughly 1 million affordable homes as well as additional aid to provide rental assistance and help first time home buyers roughly 150 billion to construct rehab and make available roughly 1 million available homes as well as Additional aid to provide rental assistance and help first time home buyers. New higher education aid, including an increase to the maximum Pell Grant by $550 for roughly 5 million students in need, and additional investments to boost historically black colleges and universities. Because it's also fun, in the case people don't know. The annual White House budget is about six trillion, and there's funding for HBCUs in that bill also. For people that don't know how this works, this 1.5 trillion is in addition to the six trillion dollar White House annual budget. So they talk about what's in the plan for climate change as well. The Biden administration aims to secure 555 billion in spending to address climate change and an amount the White House uh, says makes the bill the biggest clean energy investment in the nation's history. You can read the rest of this. We'll talk about this some more tomorrow. So this is a transformative bill. You pass this, you run on, you run on the $1.75 trillion human infrastructure bill, the $1.2 trillion traditional infrastructure bill for roads and bridges that are collapsing, deteriorating the $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. And you explain to people what's in that bill and how it's helping because a lot of people know about the, uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell on, um, MSNBC. He, he dealt with a poll that showed how it was about 60% of Americans knew about the, uh, 
uh, earned uh, childhood tax credit. But they didn't know that they were getting the extra money in their bank account because of Democrats and Joe Biden. There's, there's, a, there's a problem with messaging and messaging actually what's in a lot of these bills. And this is part of the problem with, with this bill here. There's a lack, there's a problem with messaging and messaging what's in these bills and how it's helping people. It's just like um, the deferment on student loan debt that's in the American Rescue Plan. A lot of people don't associate that with the American Rescue Plan. The $46.5 billion in rental assistance that more people are taking advantage of now, staying in their homes. And it's for not just renters, it's also for landlords. Well, the only reason why that exists. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but they're the only they're the, they're the ones that wrote the bill, and then they're, the, they're the only ones that voted for the bill. And it's helping a lot of black people stay in their homes. No Republicans voted for it in the House or the Senate. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican. Sure as hell ain't stupid. I can see who keeps voting against bills that are beneficial to us. So we'll talk about this some more tomorrow. Read this. Uh, read this piece here from. Washington Post. Uh, here's what's in the one point seven five trillion dollar Biden budget plan. And there's more in it. I just don't have the time and energy to deal with it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Vox.com had a good article on this as well. It really went through and broke this down because this stuff has to be explained. You have to break down and show what's in the bill, how it will help people. All right. Hey, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. If you want to advertise with the African History Network, email us at uh, AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AHN show at African History Network.com. Also, our current promotion is is uh buy one month, get two months free. Um so email us and uh we can get you up and running. We have a good promotion going right going on right now. We have a few, we just brought on uh I think three new advertisers, so we um have a maybe two or three more slots left. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. Okay, so email us there to uh, advertise with the African History Network. Also, African-American business owners, post the name of your business here in the thread of the broadcast. And then uh, be sure to register for the uh, online courses I teach on Saturday and Sunday. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And uh, there's a 10-week online course. You go through and analyze approximately a 10-year period of history, each class. And what... Uh, We'll also look at some events that lead up to the Civil War uh, taking place. And then the other class I teach is now that's 12 noon to 2 p.m. on Saturdays. The other class I teach on Sundays, um, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and we look at. Um, Ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley region of Africa. Um, we look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we look at what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we go through and study that also. Now, the second class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, that basically picks up where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off. Because there was so much information that I wanted to 
deal with looking at history from 1865 to 1968. There's no way I could do it in the um, first 10 week class. So I had to create a second one. So, so we can really go through and analyze this information. We can study some of these state constitutions that are written after during the Jim Crow era. This is a, it's a deep, deep history. And we see the, the legacy of the day. We see uh, in Georgia, the citizens arrest law goes back to 1863 during slavery. And it was, it was targeting runaway slaves who were running from uh, slave plantations going to uh, the Union Army, running behind Union Army lines. All right, and here's the link for uh, the uh, understanding of the transatlantic slave trade also. So we see the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow segregation we see it encoded in the laws today and, and, and still encoded in many of these state constitutions. There was a uh, article from New York Times we talked about a couple of weeks ago dealing with Alabama. Right now in Alabama, they are uh, trying to remove racist language from the state constitution in the, in the, in Alabama state constitution was last uh, written in 1901. There's an article from the New York times about this. Let me pull this up here. This is why when people say, Oh, that's all in the past. No, it's not. The law, many of those laws are still in place today. The legacy is still in place. We're still feeling the repercussions and consequences. If um, if you look at Haiti, Jamaica, and um, Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, and Cuba, they've been in the news the last few months. Jamaica is... Um, uh, preparing a petition to sue Great Britain and Queen Elizabeth for reparations. Uh, they just elected. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so you have Jamaica, you have um, Cuba is, has been in the news, but also Haiti, the uh, killing of Prime Minister Jovenel Moise and the earthquake and Haitian migrants, all this stuff, right? Well, these were all three island countries that Christopher Columbus conquered on behalf of Spain in 1492 and 1494. Those three island nations have not recovered for what happened a little more than 500 years ago. They're still feeling the repercussions. So you think we're not feeling the repercussions of what in, in chattel slavery ended 156 years ago? Alabama begins removing racist language from his constitution. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is from uh, New York Times. Good article from New York Times, which uh, is connected to the uh, Alabama state constitution in 1901. That was that was written to codify white supremacy. It was written to codify white supremacy. Many outdated provisions have long since been invalidated, but the language that was specifically intended to enshrine white supremacy has remained in the Alabama state constitution. In African-Americans, this is article last updated October 7, 2021, are working to remove that language. The last time the last time Alabama politicians rewrote their state constitution back in 1901, their aspirations were explicitly racist, quote, to establish white supremacy in the state. This is what they this is what they said they were doing. This is not hyperbole. This is what they said. They said they were rewriting the state constitution to establish white supremacy in this state. John Knox, the president of the Constitutional Convention of 1901 in Alabama said in the speech encouraging voters to ratify this, the, the new state constitution, 
He said, quote, the new constitution eliminates the ignorant Negro vote and places the control, the, the, new, the new constitution eliminates the ignorant Negro vote and places the control of our government where God Almighty intended it should be with the Anglo-Saxon race. Now, this is in 1901. This is John Knox, who was the president of the Alabama uh, uh, Constitutional Convention in 1901. This is what he said. 100 years later, the Jim Crow era laws that disenfranchised blackbirds and enforced segregation across Alabama are gone, but the offensive language written into the state constitution remains. Now, as communities across the South reconsider racist symbols and statues, activists in Alabama who have labored for 20 years to convince voters that rewriting their constitution is important and long overdue, see an opportunity to get it done. So go back and read this article. We talked about a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Alabama begins removing racist language from its constitution that was written in 1901 during the Jim Crow era. That was a legacy of slavery. And, 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 and they wrote it in Institute of Poll Taxes and Literacy Tests to suppress, Af suppress the African-American vote and lock us out of politics and lock us out of voting, et cetera. Because, you know, during Reconstruction, there's about 2,000 African-American men who got elected to um, political office, statewide office, local office, and then also in, in Congress. All right, that's going to do it for us today. That's enough radio for today. Um, thanks for tuning in. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live notifications uh, so you know when we go live. All right. And um, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, African African American business owners, email us at ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com and we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. All right, remember right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black. All positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels. Thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network. Subscribe now. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand.